What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever it is, I bet it follows a certain theme. I guess. What if I told you that you were in a scary movie right now? Well, then I'd say, of course I am. I'm a girl, aren't I? Beaten, bloodied, ignored, and bruised. And really, really angry. It's not even a hot, you dumb bitch. Do you know what that's like, by the way? To be bloodied, I mean. No. Well, do you want to? Feminine rage is all the rage these days. Think pieces, movies, aesthetic mood boards, video essays, songs. The world is stirring, waking up it seems, to the collective anger bursting from the feminine. Anya Taylor-Joy, during a press tour for The Menu, stated, I have a thing about feminine rage. I get a lot of like men doing really terrible things and women sitting silently whilst like one tear like slowly falls. And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. We get mad and angry. Carrie dripping in pig's blood, angry. The searing heat of flames, angry. The relief of an entire audience being made to listen to you for once or for the last time. Righteous anger, feminine rage. Something just talking to you as a woman. But I recently had an epiphany. Many an epiphany, actually. You wanna know my favorite scary movie? <sighs> Feelings. The first epiphany of the video is that I am sad. It's something that I feel needs to be bookended. Like, I'm sad, but I have it so much better than a lot of other people in the world. Like, exponentially. And yet, it's still swallowing me. The sadness is not a new realization, but this realization remains markedly different. Happiness has a habit of scaring me, mainly because I'm so used to groveling. Sadness for me has always been a religion, a way of being, a proof of existence. And this belief was supplemented, molded, and justified to me by my teen internet usage, especially on Tumblr. My righteous existence as a sad girl, martyred by my rough home life and the inherent strangeness I felt when placed against the world, was important to me. But my time within these spaces, compared to my time in reality, showed me a hard truth. A truth that begins our second epiphany. No one likes a sad girl, no matter their popularity on the internet. Alongside being sad, I've been a lot more angry recently. A kind of disbelieving, confused irritation at how things are and how I wish, hope, and seek to shape them into being. I tell you guys every now and then about growing up in an abusive household. What I haven't told you is that I've been faced with that same dynamic again this year. If you're in a similar situation, you may relate to the responsive anger I've been feeling. The issue is, this responsive anger is often looked down upon. It's criminalized. I'm told in so many words that anger is unbecoming of me, that I need to calm down, and that I need to learn how to communicate better without the presence of anger. The issue is, this anger is a symptom, and no one cares enough to look beyond the diagnosis and toward the root cause. I'm angry because I'm sad. I'm sad because I'm in pain. And I'm in pain because I'm unheard. And I'm unheard because, well, I'm still narrowing that down. The third epiphany that I've had is that no one likes the angry femme, least of all when they look like me no matter their popularity on the internet. And so I kept trying to break the equation. There was something I just wasn't understanding. This led me to my fourth epiphany. 
the taboo of emotion. While trying to summarize my goals for this video, I wrote this non-linear word vomit stream of consciousness rant. I want to analyze the juxtaposition between feminine rage and feminine sadness, how femme pain has been marketed and consumed as an aesthetic and a form of taste, how femme pain is a precursor to femme rage, how femme pain is shown in the media from social to film, how femme pain looks on different people from different parts of the world, how femme pain is ignored and femme rage villainized, and how utterly fucking unfair that is. What are we expected to do? Why is there nothing for us to feel without judgment? I want to analyze how femme pain is glamorized in the media and demonized in real life. How femmes can only exist in the 2D because our 3D emotions and responses are too real, too big, too ugly to be accepted in reality. We love and romanticize visuals of femme pain and femme rage because we see ourselves in them, yet simultaneously know that we can never perform them in reality. And it's not fair. It's not fucking fair. So fair warning, the language in this video is going to be hell. The topic of feminine pain and feminine rage is very strict in its gender signifiers. The culture at large actually calls it female rage. And through binary language, people tend to conflate femininity with female and female with woman. This doesn't take into account that all women aren't assigned female and all people assigned female aren't women. This language also doesn't work for me because I don't gender. <laughs> and so I'll mainly be speaking from my own experience as a vague human concept who happens to enjoy hyperfemininity. I'll be using fem and or feminine a lot to speak to my own complex experience, not to conflate those two terms. Um, but there's also just a few things to note. One, a lot of the sources I used for this video still use feminine and female as innate interchangeables, and so the language will not be uniform between us. Two, regardless of how I feel about gender, I will always be read as a black woman. Due to everything that entails, my experience is largely aligned with black womanhood and black girlness, and so the language I use may shift towards that without warning. I understand how confusing this sounds, by the way. It's like I'm genderless with gender, but no gender, and people keep giving me gender, but I don't really want it, but it's sacred to me. But also stop, have fun understanding. And that leads to number three. The gender binary purposely makes it harder to talk about the wide expanse of human expression. Femme is not used in this video as another term for woman, and it's also not an attempt to ignore other people's experiences. To me, femme speaks to a subversive queer femininity. The word has a rich history, especially in the lesbian community, and has also taken root in trans, gay, and non-binary circles. Because femininity is linked tightly with woman under the binary, regardless of the fact that anyone can be feminine, there's an interesting layer of misogyny involved in this topic. With all that being said, this video is intricately tied into discussions about womanhood due to the narrowness of the binary, but these discussions are not exclusive to, let's say, cis women. Above all, this is really an opinion piece centered on my own oddity, but if anything I say resonates with you, solidarity. And super fucking righteous emotion to you, my friends. Let's start with a sort of pipeline, one that can easily be understood. Here's femme. Femme hurt, femme feel pain, femme pain still ignored, commodified, and aestheticized. Femme pain still not taken seriously. Femme angry, femme villain, femme breathe hellfire onto the world. Why waste time say lot word when few word do trick? 
Horror is a good place to find this pipeline. It's a genre that's most associated with misogyny and torture corn, though some have argued that the genre didn't start out that way, while others argue that these categories largely speak to slasher movies, not horror as a whole. But here is Femme in a horror movie. Femme hurt, Femme feel pain, Femme pain still ignored. Femme isn't actually flying, she's hovering. It's really not that impressive. Wow, nice insult, Hannah Montana. You got any more harsh digs? Jennifer Check from Jennifer's Body is the ultimate sad girl turned raging femme monster. She's published all across the internet, from Tumblr to Instagram to fucking, I don't know, deviant art or something. People love Jennifer Check. And they love sad to monster heroines just like her. Pearl, Cassie Howard, Alice Chambers, Nina Sayers. You know what they all have in common? What? They're white? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> they all have a celestial celebrity about them online. Leslie Jamison argues that the pain and violence these women face is like witnessing a car wreck. Sparkling bent metal, glass dancing on hot pavement. We can't look away, Jameson states. We can't stop imagining new ways for them to hurt. And yet we, and the narrative, are uncomfortable with their pain. We leave them twisted in that car wreck. We commit a hit and run. Cassie's dad ignores the pain he causes her. Alice's Harry Styles Redditor boyfriend ignores her agency. Nina Sayers is pushed to the edge daily until she snaps. The narrative of these movies reflect the reality of real life. Women's pain often goes ignored. In a 2001 study called The Girl Who Cried Pain, researchers concluded that women are less likely to be given medication for pain than men. Women's pain, the study argues, is taken less seriously. They are more likely to have their pain reports discounted as emotional or psychogenic and therefore not real. This ignorance deepens the further you travel across identity lines. When I think of ignored pain, specifically in terms of misogyny, I think of black mothers who hemorrhage on the birthing table because doctors refuse to see their pain. I think of the murdered and missing indigenous women who are silenced and never returned, not even acknowledged by wider society. I think of trans women who are denied access to gender affirming care. I think of women experiencing war who are told that they are merely collateral in the fight. Sudanese women, Palestinian women, Asian women from Vietnam to the Philippines to Korea, China, and Japan. I think of Jewish women who are stripped of their humanity by gendered anti-Semitism. I think of impoverished women who are swallowed up by statistics women in abusive situations, women under the patriarchy, women under imprisonment, women under capitalism, women under duress. Lisa must die! The sad girl is one of many responses to pain. According to Alice Hines, sad girls are young women, likely in affluent Western countries, who spend time online and embody a particular paradox, the desire to express their deepest interior feelings through an aesthetic mini-consider formulaic. Certainly, there are a large majority of women who adopt the sad girl aesthetic online, but I would argue the sad girl seeks more to represent a way of existing in the world, a way of consumption, and expression. It's a form of taste, not a way of being gendered. Sydney Gore, who wrote about the sad girl in 2014, argues, the sad girl is sarcastic, witty, and self-deprecating. She listens to better music than you and might spend her time alone watching French films from the 60s or angsty TV shows from the 90s. The sad girl likes pizza. They have a killer sense of style and they're funny in a hashtag dark way because they like their comedy the way they like their coffee. Dark, bitter, and too hot for you. The sad girl archetype saw its heyday on Tumblr when I was 14. That was 10 years ago. But the sad girl isn't dead yet. It keeps morphing, adapting to new trends, new mediums, new people. As Amber Levis argues, the sad girl is meant to create an enduring mood. It's an unchanging landscape set to the lowest frequency. It's a solipsistic sadness that is static and therefore comforting. 
experience a melancholy we don't quite want to shake off. The difference between the sad girl of the internet and femme pain in real life is that the sad girl has an audience in ways offline people may not. People whose pain is ignored in real life latch on to the characters of sadness and rage and make them celestial. Through this convoluted dance between essentialization and grief, pain becomes integral to femininity. Think of the phrase, beauty is pain. Well, just a word, beauty is often used exclusively as a feminine signifier. Therefore, the phrase can be translated to, femininity is pain. Essentialization also dictates that feminine expression is inherently tied to female traits, and femaleness is inherently tied to woman, capital W. So the conversation often shifts from pain being integral to femininity to pain being integral to womanhood. The Greek dramatist Menander once said, woman is a pain that never goes away. Therefore, pain is the unending glue and prerequisite of women's consciousness. I'm a girl, aren't I? Essentialization is where feminine pain becomes commercialized. When pain is considered an integral element to being perceived as feminine, it becomes an integral element in selling femmes back to themselves. For example, you can buy Sad Girls Club bumper stickers for $13 on Etsy, sweatshirts with I'm pretty cool but I panic a lot on the front, and wipe tears here on the sleeves for $36.79. Even baddies get saddies t-shirts, anxiety princess crop tops, sarcastic mental health hoodie, funny unwell as fuck, sweatshirt depression awareness trendy, sarcastic phrase pullover PTSD aware anxiety gift for $37.72. The feminine market, that is, the market that sells products and media that is coded as feminine, that being makeup, certain styles of clothing, certain movies, is pervasive. The very act of trying to essentialize feminine identity is the very act of trying to sell feminine identity. That's why the sad girl is inherently commercialized and has more to do with taste than, I would say, gender identity. The sad girl listens to better music than you. They wear better clothes than you. They consume better than you. And this is also why the sad girl and the rageful feminine have not gone out of style, no matter how long they've been portrayed in the media and no matter how long they've been consumed by sad teenagers on the internet. When it comes to marketing the feminine, Brazil mentions consumption engineering, a marketing strategy that contributes to unceasing growth. By constantly rearranging the same taste in new ways, the market is always prospering. Why else is the vanilla girl the same as clean girl, is the same as pearl girl, is the same as Hailey Baldwin Bieber cinnamon latte lips girl? Why? Because, because they're all the same things being rearranged in new ways to keep people buying. Aesthetic niches make the markets go round. The interesting thing about femme pain in the media, from film to social, is that it's simultaneously doing two things, reclamation and fetishization. The fetishization argument is like 10 times more popular among think pieces. Amber Levis argues that the sad girl reaffirms the conditions that made girls sad in the first place. The sad girl is complacent. She makes us see her sadness in all its glory without any real appeal for change. She doesn't seem to want to change. She'd live her life with the sad girl starter pack playing in the background. According to Levis and those who hold similar views, the sad girl aesthetic appeals to conventional beauty standards, and it beautifies suffering. Not only is it dominated by images of white women, as I've interjected so many times so far, but it also censors the narrative of conventionally attractive, affluent, thin, white, cisgender women. Let's look at the comments under a Rot Girl Autumn aesthetic mood board on Instagram. The diversity in this is amazing. One user writes sarcastically. I guess dark skinned girls be feeling I right this time of year in other states. <laughs> Reminding us that being sad is only cool if you're skinny and pretty. It's kind of funny when conventionally attractive women are the only ones allowed to feel unattractive and it's romanticized. Indeed, out of 26 characters, only about three are women of color, I think. The video goes by kind of fast. Jenna Ortega, 
Taylor Russell and Alexa Demi are all the women of color I caught. Regardless, the palette of the video is very beige mommy blogger. <laughs> I feel like Acacia Kersey was in charge of decorating again. The demographic of the sad girl, no matter the name it's assumed under, no matter what platform it's on or movie or medium, is all the same. Intentionally or unintentionally, the signifiers of the sad girl are predominantly linked to attractiveness, skinniness, wealth, and good taste. The way in which these signifiers and models are supported on the internet comes across as fetishization. Fetishization. To fetishize means to fixate upon, to hold irrational reverence or obsessive devotion. A short scroll through the Tumblr tags, sad girl, girl blogger, or any iteration of Lana Del Rey produces these results. Fixation, reverence, devotion, white, skinny, godliness. But just because feminine pain is aestheticized doesn't make it any less important to discuss. And I've noticed how we continue cycles of shaming that were evident 10 years ago in the same niche. We criticize people who blog about feminine pain and call them attention seekers or agents of obfuscation. We argue that they misuse their own pain and ruin it for the people who are actually afflicted. We nullify their feelings because they don't perform it in a way we agree with. Leslie Jameson counters this way of thinking by stating, we may have turned the wounded woman into a kind of goddess, romanticized her illness and idealized her suffering. But that doesn't mean she doesn't happen. Women still have wounds. How do we talk about these wounds without corroborating an old mythos that turns female trauma into celestial constellations worthy of worship? The answer might lie in those who view the sad girl as an act of reclamation, barring how narrow it can be, of course. Audrey Wolin, who coined sad girl theory, argues, I think that a sad girl's self-destruction, no matter how silent or commonplace, is a strategy for subverting those systems, for making the implicit violence visceral and visible, for implicating us all in her devastation. With that in mind, let's go back to that pipeline from earlier and re-examine it through different terms. Here's femme. Femme hurt, femme feel pain, femme pain still ignored, femme finds idols through media, idols feel the same pain as femme, femme finally feels seen, femme aestheticizes, commercializes, and yes, fetishizes, but femme is finally seen. I mean, where's the harm in that? As Jameson contends, relying too much on the image of the wounded woman is reductive, but so is rejecting it. Being unwilling to look at the varieties of need and suffering that yield it. We don't want to be wounds, but we should be allowed to have them, to speak about having them, to be something more than just another girl who has one. In this way, it's tempting to argue that sad girl bloggers are rightfully broadcasting their voices and amplifying their pain to the world at large. Pain that continuously keeps getting ignored. It's tempting to argue this mainly because I get it. I used to do it all the time as a teenager. I wrote fiction about pain, informed by my own trials and tribulations as a teenager, and posted them online. As an adult, I still curate playlists that speak to my sadness, pain, and rage. I create entire worlds, pin mood boards that reflect my desolation. And yeah, every now and then, I watch movies that reflect my interior life. I mainly just watch Matilda. <laughs> Without the media that speaks to us, in a world where we're already ignored, manipulated, and silenced, we would all be alone. So this sort of media is important. And yet, it's still very possible to participate in this internet culture uncritically and unhealthily. Earlier, when I mentioned the religious aspect of being sad, I said how it was stoked in part by my time on the internet. From 2012 onward, Tumblr was an oasis for people like me, but it was also a tool that could be used negatively. I never committed to growing or fighting or healing myself because the media I consumed through Tumblr at the time told me it was futile, that I would always be like this, that it was righteous to be like this. My pain was 
essential. It was angelic. It was a way of deepening my own tastes and thoughts. The sad girl listens to better music than you. The sad girl dresses better than you. The sad girl is cooler than you. Audrey Wolin argues in defense of the sad girl archetype. Feminine sadness should be read as resistance, even though it acts passively through internalization rather than externalization, through violence against bodies instead of public space, through weeping instead of shouting. The issue is this line of thinking creates a cycle, a cycle that the larger world wants from the feminine. Systems of oppression want to inflict pain, and they want for that pain to go unspoken, to be internalized, and then aimed at oneself in a vicious explosion of self-deprecation. It wants that pain to be commercialized so that it cannot be deepened beyond monetary value. It wants that pain to be static, quiet, dormant, and niche. The world cannot handle a sad girl in real life. They tolerate the sad girl online. Anything to placate people before they realize the root of their own pain. Because that insufferable bastard root, that is the beginning of rage. The horror genre is an interesting vehicle. If we're talking about slashers, it's a genre that features disproportionate screen time for gendered violence. A 1993 study by Moliter and Sapolsky showed that women took twice as long to be killed on screen than their man counterparts, specifically when it came to slashers. The time dedicated to these on-screen deaths were usually eaten up by seductive runs through the woods, boobies bouncing bountifully, or women characters begging, crying, or writhing around in bloody, mutilated torture. I think about these peculiar details of the slasher. The same way Canon Brazil, I think that's how you say that, thinks of the foundation of Esquire magazine. Esquire was the first attempt, Brazil argues, at creating an organized male audience. A future editor for Esquire, Arnold Greenrich, found men to be an eclectic consumer market, but understood the prolific power of women as consumers. To solve these two inconsistencies, Esquire simultaneously exploited women while denying their feelings, pain, and overall existence, really. Slashers do something similar. They were one of the leading genres to cast women as main characters. But these characters were often exploited, their pain fetishized, their deaths sexualized, and their existence narrowed. Not in my movie. Horror as a whole has always reflected the socio-political reality of its current period, which is explored more in depth in this video essay by Donna. Horror movies force us to confront our mortality through our greatest internal and external fears. And if we look back at horror movies throughout history, we can see how changes in society, culture, and politics directly influence the kinds of horror being produced. The exploitation and simultaneous denial of feminine pain is real, so it makes sense for the horror genre to so bluntly depict it. It also makes sense that over the past decade, the horror genre has expanded to include shifting conversations surrounding race, class, and even gender. Jameson states, the general outline goes something like this. Girl gets, girl gets, girl gets. Not that she's granted things, but that things keep happening to her until they don't. Until she starts doing onto others as they have done, hurting everyone who ever hurt her, moving the world with her mind, conducting its objects like an orchestra. This is the beginning phase of feminine rage getting and hating what you're getting, despising it, realizing that it isn't what you deserve. As I deal with my burgeoning anger, I'm both afraid of it and in awe of it. I'm afraid because like Carrie's anger, my own rage is imprecise. She spares no one in that gym, no one on the road, indeed no one in her life. But I'm in awe of this anger because as an abused child who grew into an abused adult, anger was never afforded to me, especially as a black child and especially as a person read as a woman. 
Anger was and is a kind of taboo emotion to feel, even when you're pushed into it. Nay, bitch, especially when you're pushed into it. There's a fifth epiphany that I recently had. I had it in the shower, somewhere between screaming paramour and trying not to get soap into my eyes. I consider myself an intelligent person. I don't know everything, but I'm willing to learn. I like learning about feminism and humanity and all the things that cope the world. I can see something happen in the media or I can see a stranger do something or even I can do something. And I'm able to point it out by saying, that's misogynistic or that supports the patriarchy. But I realize I never apply that logic to family members. I think families are really complex. We don't know how to talk about them unless they're good families. It's a sort of cognitive dissonance. The way families are expected to be, the way they're depicted in mass media, versus what they can sometimes devolve into. I think from the start, my family was a broken one. My father was abusive, but I never saw beyond that word, abuse. It wasn't until I started reading The Will to Change by Bell Hooks that I looked at my father through a patriarchal lens. And because I started looking at him through a patriarchal lens, I had to start looking at other people in my family through that same lens. I came to realize that a portion of the pain I'm currently feeling stems from patriarchal mores. I had to fight my daddy, I had to fight my uncles, I had to fight my brothers. Girl, child ain't safe in a family man. And so I'm angry. I don't know how to describe it. It doesn't fit into prose or poetry or lyrics for the most part. I'll eat Mad Woman by Taylor Swift down. But the anger I feel transcends everything, even the pain. Only on some days though. What I've noticed is that it wasn't until I started getting angry that people started paying attention. The same way mass media is waking up to feminine rage, the people in my life who have ignored the pain they've caused me are waking up to my anger and they're denouncing it. They're critiquing it. They're trying to determine when, how, and at whomst. I can be angry. Feminine rage in the media is usually lauded, at least by other rageful people on the internet. But when it manifests in real life, it becomes too messy, too threatening, too systems in place, too threatening to comfort. Megan Nolan wrote in The Functions of Female Rage that real life feminine rage seems to only be accepted when it's useful. And certainly anger is a vehicle for useful change, protests, revolutions, politics. This sort of rage matters, but my anger doesn't feel useful. My pain has been ignored and the anger that bloomed from it is only villainized. I know it won't change anything, not in the minds of the people who matter, and yet I still feel it. The question is, what does anger and pain mean to you? Welcome to the toe section of the video, where I read your email responses to my most recent topical newsletter. You can find the Tone newsletter for free on Substack, linked in the description. Rosa writes, Ignoring pain is a big part of American culture, as well as Western femininity overall. It is like most things, a symptom of late stage capitalism. We are told to shut down our feelings for the sake of keeping the peace. What does that peace entail? I get out of bed, I clean the house, I go to work, the bills get paid. Those are my priorities, not myself not my emotions. I know that confronting generations worth of pain and working to build healthier habits would not only take time, but it would take too much time. Time is money, they tell us. I know that, but every time the phrase resurfaces in my mind, I hear the Kill Bill sirens as I feel my life slipping through my fingertips. Anger, hatred, rage. Those feelings and acting on them take no time at all. It is easier to be angry than to be healthy because it is faster. The faster we can remember to ignore our needs, the more productive we can be. The product is the end-all be-all in America, not the producer. Paula, a 19-year-old queer woman, emailed, our anger, our pain is ridiculed. We are the hysterical women, unable to control themselves, 
always overreacting, feeble-minded. Our emotions are silly. In discussions or arguments, it is fatal to let slip how you feel about the issue being discussed. The way you act, your emotions always overshadow your arguments, your logic, what you actually have to say. I'm ashamed of my agitation when passionately discussing something. I can feel the others dismissing me. Z is someone who uses he, they pronouns, and he wrote in, Sometime, pretty soon before I socially transitioned, I had this feeling that I needed to reckon with my relationship to femininity. Something in me craved to acknowledge all the hurt I had felt and been feeling due to being seen as a woman. Yes, from dysphoria, but also from attempting to see myself from the eyes and minds of others within the framework of bioessentialist sexism and patriarchy. Something I imagine people of all genders experience, but especially women and femmes. It made me feel so insecure of my self-image, but I let myself feel that pain for the first time without downplaying its effects on my daily life and it fermented into a feminine rage that was sometimes so cathartic it felt empowering. Although I know there were times I directed it irresponsibly, and I do regret that. When I finally let myself feel that feminine rage, I realized it was the only part of girlhood I felt any real identification with. It was definitely time for me to find a new home in masculinity, and I feel like my experience with feminine rage was a very necessary step towards that and it provided me with useful experience and insights I can put towards navigating masculinity and becoming the person I want to be. Anonymous wrote, Lately, I've been seeing a lot of necessary, mostly correct conversations about toxic masculinity that add as an afterthought, women get to express their emotions. That's why they're emotionally healthier. But do we though? And are we healthier? Most women I know, myself included, feel a deep chasm of disconnect from our feelings. What we feel, especially rage, but even happiness, is always filtered through a complex interrogation. Is it physically safe to express this feeling right now? Or will there be immediate backlash from some violent guy, maybe even a violent guy living in our home? Sometimes it's a violent woman. Is it professionally prudent to express this emotion right now? Or will we lose their situational respect we earn through hard work? Is showing this emotion going to make us come across as girly or as mannish, which is worse in a given situation? How do our other identities impact this perception? Do we look good when expressing this emotion? Is our voice fine or is it shrill, whiny, screechy, childish, yet again, mannish? If we laugh or cry, is it an appropriate register? Does it sound fake? Are our emotions fake? Do we know? Does anyone know? I don't know, Shan. I think we are not okay. Men, of course, are also not okay. Are NBs okay? I hope so, but I doubt it. Another anonymous submission states, Dear Shanspear, under the patriarchy, no one can have complete feelings. You are confined to feel only one side of the gendered feeling spectrum, which aligns with your gender presentation. Masculine people are never allowed to be anything vulnerable, and femmes are never allowed to be scary. Both of these phenomena link to the idea of being indigestible. When feminine people get mad and their full humanness is shown, it is indigestible. Therefore, to deal with this, the rage is either sexualized, think of the idea of the femme fatale who dominates men by seducing them, or even the girl with daddy issues, is made fun of or even ignored. The patriarchy will find ways to diminish what it doesn't value. All humanists be damned. Something I've noticed is how I've become committed to not feeling my feelings. I was always called sensitive as a child. I cried at everything. My emotions were usually larger than I was, and so it made people really uncomfortable. This was true of my teens as well. But I noticed as an adult, I don't cry often. I feel overwhelming sadness, grief, and sometimes anger, but I hate letting them pass through me. I don't want to be a sieve. I want to be an armored prison. I often refer to having to feel things as my brain tormenting me. And that's not really healthy, is it love? <laughs> if I compare my aversion to emotion as a prison, I think it's apt to think of Angela Davis, a leading voice in the prison abolition movement. In an interview, she talks about being capacious, that is having space within oneself. You can and should experience rage, she says, but also profound community and connections with other people. You should work towards a healing balance. And what I just did there, that 
analogy yeah it's ironic because <laughs> it's ironic based on what i'm going to say next i've also noticed how quickly i rush to intellectualize my pain i like to read self-help books psychology books or just any text by black authors who speak toward this mass of feeling inside of me and i think it partially comes from wanting to feel heard i feel heard in the writings of baldwin and hooks and i don't feel heard anywhere else in my world. But I also like running from just feeling. I want to immediately make sense of a feeling before I even understand what that feeling is. There's a quote that I saw on Tumblr, of all places, that was like, the only way out is through. Me when the only way out is through. <laughs> and the iconic let it linger slogan. Have you let it linger today, queen? I should be a sieve, I should. Put a pot of hot pasta water through me and I'll drain it. Wash a bed of strawberries in me and I'll separate the dirt from the berry, baby, in theory. But I feel conditioned both by the patriarchy, my family life, and my own fears to never actually contend with my emotions, let alone share them with others. I wonder if our culture is in a rush to do the same if our obsession with feminine rage is a way to speed through our other emotions. The sad girl has become extremely cynical as of late. The pain presented through this niche is ironic and hard to sift through. And then we step right over the sad girl to embrace the rageful feminine, who seems better to us from our low point in grief. Anger is warmer, it's more driven, some may say, and it seems like a haven compared to deep sadness. Jameson argues that we've collectively moved into a place of post-woundedness. People who are still hurting quickly shift away from showing or even acknowledging their wounds. These women are aware that woundedness is overdone and overrated. They are wary of melodrama, so they stay numb or clever instead. Post-wounded women make jokes about being wounded or get impatient with women who hurt too much. In a post-wounded world, what do you do if you're still sad? What if others are moving on, but you can't? If I learned nothing over the past year, I would try to end this video on a really high note. I tell you that all of this is in the past and that I'm cured. And I frolic through fields of emotion and I don't care if a deer tick bites me for Whose southern grandma just possessed me to say that? The thing is, I can end this video on a note of hope, but I cannot end it on a note of peace. So many of us have fallen down the pipeline of feminine pain to feminine rage, and we've only circled back again because this pipeline is not linear. This shit is a Mario pipe. It will take a lot of work to heal that part of us that was ignored, but it's possible. And I wish it for everyone, no matter who you are, where you are, what you're doing. Healing and love and rage if you need it, even if it's not useful. I send that all to you. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you later. Bye. I love you.